So, uh, preachers, we uh, know that this has been a busy season for you, and we are so grateful uh, that you have uh, stayed with us and that you have been faithful in the communities where you have a sphere of influence. And we just want to thank you for the work that you do. We really think that good preaching changes lives. In some cases, it saves lives. And so we're grateful uh, that you're making the extra effort uh, during this season to, to preach well, to preach faithfully, uh, and to preach honestly. And now that you go into Holy Week, know that you are held with the love that Jesus talks about on that last night of his life, of love one another as I have loved you, that God holds you in that love, Jesus holds you in that love. And we are so grateful that you preach that love uh, to the people who need to hear it. So thank you for your thank you for your preaching and know that you are held this week as you anticipate the resurrection in love. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for April 10th, 2022, which is both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday, or both, uh, are these. First of all, from the procession of palms, the gospel text is Luke 19, 28 through 40. And then the text for Passion Sunday are Isaiah 50, 4 through 9a, Psalm 31, 9 through 16, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and Luke 22, 14 through 23, 56. We have a lot of texts, and we don't give you absolutely every text you could have <laughs> had read in your service, but we do have a lot. So we recognize that different liturgical traditions and even different congregations have different habits and, and priorities for this Sunday. But why don't we start with a couple of comments about the Lucan triumphal entry, the, the Palm Sunday narrative, and then we'll talk a bit about preaching the passion from Luke's gospel and, and maybe with those other texts woven in. So. Sounds good. All right. Luke 19. If they well, were silent, even the rocks would cry out. Yeah, I, I was actually going to. I, I can't believe I'm suggesting this, but I'm not suggesting adding verses. It depends on, because you, as you already just said, like we have more verses than we know what to do with. Uh, but what I, what I think is significant about this whole section or the, the uh, Jesus triumphal entry here, uh, if you're focusing on the passion uh, or on the, on the Palm Sunday uh, event of Jesus is you know, in verse 41, as he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Uh, that that call to that call to recognition and what are we seeing in this moment, which is such a Lucan theme in general, of of seeing who Jesus sees and seeing what God sees and do we do we or do we not see the kingdom of God. But to me, just kind of, you know, when you read these passages and then you read around to figure out where, you know, where we are in the in the narrative and such. It's uh, for me, it was an invitation to say, what what do you see in this Palm Sunday? What do you recognize? What do you or what do you want to see or what do you not want to see? Because there's, you know, there's so much uh the triumphal, you know, it's often, it's called the triumphal entry <laughs> into Jerusalem, but what's triumphant about it? I mean, we know what's going to happen next. This is what's, you know, the, you have the cleansing of the temple and then, and then it's going to be working toward the arrest of Jesus. And so that the entry into Jerusalem is not going to end well. And, uh, and so, uh, I think it, that's that's where I kind of landed was what what is it that you see in this entry moment into Jerusalem? Uh, what do you see about what do you see about Jesus or what are you willing to see that could be could be an angle into Palm Sunday in general, maybe? One idea. I like that, Caroline. Uh, and I like that you move forward in the text uh, to keep our eyes on what Jesus uh, has seen. Uh, another way to do that, and also not wanting to add verses, but um, to, to echo everything that has happened before 
uh, to bring us to this moment. So, so why is it that people are responding to Jesus in this way? Because Jesus has already demonstrated that kind of caring, that kind of offering of peace, that kind of presence that um, will make it where people um, have this sense of God has shown up and blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And um, when I think about uh, having this text before us that in the communion, communion rituals, so many of us repeat, um, how to use this opportunity to describe this moment as the experience of the people uh, who were with Jesus when he walked on earth that caused this moment to be etched into their memory so that whenever we have that rehearsal during the communion litur liturgy, all of this comes back to mind, which really uh, puts a little bit on the pressure, a little bit of pressure on the preacher to prepare this moment so that it becomes etched in the memory, uh, that this particular sermon becomes etched in the memory so that when that is echoed during the communion service, uh, it, it is just as powerful and poignant. I love Luke's uh, version of, of Jesus approaching the city. And I, one of the reasons I love it is because he's not even in the city. He's, mm. He hasn't even come down from the Mount of Olives. He probably can't even see Jerusalem yet from where he is. And nobody in Jerusalem can probably see him. And so it's, which was probably most likely because if he was to show up walking into Jerusalem with a thousand people saying, here's the king, the story would probably end on the next page. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not quite like the movies make it out to be. Um, but here's probably this ragtag group of folks and they've got this little spy game to get the animal, you know, that he can ride in and it's all secret and hush hush. And, and it's probably taking place without a lot of folks around watching and, but it's still this prophetic demonstration. And then he weeps over the city, like you read Caroline. And that's, these are really poignant moments of a king who's not recognized uh, of a prophet who nobody's listening to. People will listen to him in the city, but for the most part, he's, he knows he's not going to sway the whole city or whatever that, that you know, that whatever he would be hoping for. But it's still real and it's still true and it's still incredibly dangerous. So the Pharisees that are around are like, tell him to shut up, right? Can't say that stuff. Roman ears, there's spies everywhere. People report stuff in this culture, you know, and and his response is, you know, all nature is going to break into song or break into shouts. You know, it just it just doesn't matter. The cat is out of the bag, so to speak. And uh, this is going to become visible and this is going to become real. And it's and that's just what it is. And so there's something that's so I use the word ragtag. I mean, it's something that's just kind of so upside down about the scene to me. Of course, it's all very serious and all very real and all very true. But it just is this great introduction to all of the confusion that's going to permeate the story of the passion in Luke's gospel and all of the disappointment that's going to come with Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus. Um, so yeah, just to kind of set that up of just the, again, the, the, the bizarre nature of this. That's where I would go. I don't know if that preaches or anything, but I'd have fun preaching on it. So there's that. <laughs> so should we go to the passion? Yeah. And so one thing we've talked don't about. Don't read it. Hmm? Don't read it all. <laughs> well, that again, people have all of their their own, you know, uh, own traditions or what how they've planned worship around around uh for this for this Sunday. But one thing we've done in the past is to uh lift out a portion of our verses or a moment in the passion narrative that uh, that ha that has been particularly that struck us this year, or that uh, as we think about our own contexts and such, that uh, th that we might lift up. So, should we do that again? Of lifting I up. I think a we should. Yeah, because okay. it's too long to read the whole thing, and if you want us to talk about every single Luke in detail we can't do it without making this a three hour podcast. Right, right. So we're, who's starting then? How are we doing this? Well, where, where, is there a, a verse or moment that you two were drawn to this year? 
Well, I, I'm caught with the dispute that rose up among them um, regarding who was the greatest. So in um, uh, verses 14 through 23, Jesus uh, is saying, you know, um, I'm going to suffer. I, Jesus is saying, I've wanted, I've waited for this moment. Jesus is saying, here we are. And they start fighting over who, who's got this right? Who's done this better? Who's the greatest? Ouch. How, how that, for me, that parallels with how often we miss um, the suffering that is around us, the cries of, of those who are around us, um, as we're trying to make sure that somebody sees us. And, and I, I, it just, again, seems in this particular moment, uh, we're at war. People are, are dealing with loss. Um, uh, our economy is uh, crazy. The, the climate is crazy. There's so much around us. And we're still trying to figure out, is my tribe more right than your tribe? Did I get it right better than you? So I don't know. If, if For me, if I was going to try and raise some passion I think that's where I'd go. So maybe it's a good thing I'm not preaching this year. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Matt? Well, I'm, now I'm, I'm terrified that I said this three years ago and maybe six years ago. <laughs> I'm going to hope that everybody else's memory is as poor as mine. So <laughs> I'm going to go to uh, verses 20, uh, chapter 22, verses 28 through 30. You're those who have stood by me my trials. I confer on you just as my father has conferred on me a kingdom. And this comes just between what Joy talked about, the, the contrast the contrast between the Gentiles and the, the rulers of this earth and the, the ethics that they play by, the, the ways of getting ahead. And it comes just before Jesus' warning to Peter that Simon has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, that, that they're, they're in the midst of a demonic battle of sorts or a spiritual battle of sorts. And this is really high stakes and dangerous and it's, they're in way over their heads. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand how power works. They don't understand anything. Um, but nevertheless, right? I confer on you, just my father's conferred on me a kingdom, this idea of this promise, which I think is resonant of um, Luke chapter 12, verse 32, where he says, it's, it's the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Hmm in the midst of a larger discourse about not being anxious and not worrying. And it's, you know, there are these moments, Matthew's gospel has the moment, my yoke is easy, my burden light. Uh, Luke has moments every now and then where you think, oh, that's right. At the heart of this thing, there really is a sense of gift. There really is a sense of grace uh, and a sense that, um, that God understands just how difficult this is from my point of view. And it's a beautiful scene and to have that be announced here in the midst of so much confusion. He's going to talk about swords in another paragraph and they're going to misunderstand that and it's going to get weird and he's going to be arrested before you know it. And, but here's this moment. And I would think that if I was sitting there, this is the thing I would remember. I'm like, I can get my head around this. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to look like, but I can get my head around this. And that's something not to miss. That's, that's um, at the heart of this is, is graciousness and generosity on God's behalf toward, uh, toward us. There's a lot of other stuff going on too, but I would, I would, depending upon the context in which I was preaching, that's something I'd want to highlight. I went to the the unique portion of the passion narrative in John, one of the unique portions of the passion narrative in John of the two criminals uh, who are crucified. Uh, you just betrayed yourself by calling it John. Yeah, did. did I just say John? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Luke, 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 Luke. Sorry, I know we're in Luke. I know it, I know it. Uh, but the, the scene with the two criminals, 39 to 43, but particularly, uh, you, okay, so you have the, the criminals are there and you, you know, we don't know if anybody overhears any of that. I mean, is anybody there listening to the criminals and Jesus, you know, having a conversation on the cross and, but the verse 43, uh, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, 
verse 42. And then Jesus said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And I just was so struck by paradise and the lack thereof in scripture <laughs> that, it, that I, I did a little quick, you know, a little quick uh, accordance search. And, and that term appears in second Corinthians. And then again, in revelation two, seven, and yet how much the word paradise is in, in our, in our lore, but also just in our whole ethos of, of what do we hope for? And, and is that equated with salvation in the kingdom? Is that equated with heaven? What does paradise mean? Uh, what is the promise here? Is paradise and kingdom equivalent? But if we say that, then what, what is God's paradise compared to what we think paradise is? Uh, and, and then also I, I, I get a little bit uh, caught up in dystopian kind of uh, shows and movies and, and where, uh, where it's not paradise <laughs> at all. And, uh, but, but maybe to just to, I, I don't know, just to play with that term in terms of that, uh, that this is, that this is a paradise moment, but how, uh, how anti-world this paradise moment is. You know, today you will be with me in paradise and it just completely upends our, all of our constructs of what paradise means. And the whole gospel has done that, you know, that, the, that, that Jesus is ushering in a kingdom that is, that is not how the world sees what a kingdom is. And that, uh, and, and this, and especially if that is equated with, uh, you know, our ideas of what paradise is, uh, and it, or is it, you know, is paradise, you know, in this moment with Jesus. So I, I'm not sure entirely where I would go with that yet, but that's what really struck me. Just like that claim of that promise of paradise that, that I, I'm all, I, I find myself always drawn to terms that have taken on a life of their own uh, in our culture. And, uh, and yet here it gets located on the cross between Jesus and two criminals um, who, are, who are being executed with him. And that's really striking to me. I appreciate the comment about paradise being in short supply, not just in the usage in scripture, but uh, in our own yeah. imagery, or we assign it to far off places like vacation paradises and island paradises. I mean, it's about Which escapism for the most It's probably part. what I thought of too, to be perfectly honest. I yeah, right. probably was thinking of a beach somewhere with palm trees and a lovely little beverage with a, an umbrella in it, but continue. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my point is, yeah, that, that's how God's promises come in the midst of things, how they aren't necessarily escapism. I get for the criminal, it probably is. He's probably in the last place that anybody would want to be at this moment. But yeah, yeah. But the contrast there is so dramatic, mm -hmm. um, especially when you consider what he can probably see from where he is and where, and I mean that figuratively in terms of see, you know, just the, yeah. the desolation. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Probably smells terrible, looks terrible. There's probably bones all over the place. I mean, it just is like the least... Yeah, you get my point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do we want to say anything about Isaiah 50 and Psalm 31? I mean, Isaiah 50, we'll some, there's some themes that are going to show up again on Good Friday when we do Isaiah 52 and 53. And both texts Wonderful. about people who are a reproach and who suffer <laughs> uh, deeply, but also experience God's vindication here in Isaiah 50 and Psalm 31. I'll, I'll note this, and maybe this is just the academic in me, um, but it, it goes along with what I was saying, too, in terms of the juxtaposition of um, the suffering and then the question of who is the greatest. Um, I, I was struck this time in verse four. Um, um, of Isaiah or the psalm? Isaiah 50. Oh, there is no I'll, verse four in the psalm. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to make a parallel with the psalm as, uh, as well. But uh, yeah, you're right. The, the giveaway was verse four. Um, Wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught 
and not looking at that in terms of listening as someone who knows, but is listening as someone who is being taught. Um, and and that, that, like I said, that just goes on with how I was leaning into the Luke passage uh, to, to say, how do I not pay attention to where I've gotten it right, but to hear those who are, are suffering? And what, what, what makes for a better teacher? Not to say I'm the greatest, but as I'm wanting to convey this as giving something to those who need to hear. Um, and that just struck me um, as I was reading it. And, um, and maybe that's just the theme that I'm in. Um, because again, in, in Psalm, it's that same thing. Be gracious to me, God, because where am I? I'm in distress. Um, my eye waste away from grief. Uh, uh, it was heightened again, as you talked, Matt, about what, what it is figuratively that the thief on the cross could see. Um, this, this reality of sorrow and the need for God to be God, uh, as, we, as we said, um, for God's character um, uh, to be evident, um, needs to carry through this week as a, a well, needs to carry through in this moment in particular. And I, I don't know, I just seem to be stuck in this sort of uh, juxtaposition of, of the distress and need of some deliverance. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't want to turn the story of Jesus' passion into just um, into self-help, certainly, but there's so much language in these passages that relates to people in so many everyday experiences, right? I mean, Psalm 31, I have passed out of mind like one who is dead, one who has died, one who was dead. I have become like a broken vessel. I mean, I I, I know people who feel this way after two months of a pandemic, for example, and the isolation that they've experienced and just the, the psychological um, pain that, that this has caused through loss in their life, through all sorts of, of changed patterns in their life. Um, you don't need a pandemic to feel that way either. Right? But I mean, all the ways in which there's something about the strength of these two passages in terms of what they describe that make it really hard to approach the passion without feeling a sense of your own brokenness, but especially to be aware to those around you who are, in, at least I feel this in my own case, who are suffering way more than I've ever imagined suffering myself. Mm -hmm. And then think about how in the world is there any good news in any of this story? <laughs> Beyond distrust in the Lord, but that seems to be the refrain. Well, uh, yeah, and, and verse 14, but I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God. Uh, we, we have certain words that are said by Jesus from the cross, and of course, we all know the parallels with the, the use of Psalm 22, uh, but I have to imagine that Jesus had other things that he said <laughs> uh, or that he remembered. Uh, and and uh, reading this portion of of Psalm 31, I wondered that I, I I wonder if Jesus said, "But I trust in you, O Lord. You are my God. My times are in your hand." And uh, and particularly, my times are in your hand when, like going back to what I mentioned about today, you will be with me in paradise. You have this combination of present and future tense. Uh, that that time is time is sort of, uh, uh, is upended, that our times, and, and you know, your reference to the pandemic, Matt, in terms of how time is, is really lost a lot of its <laughs> meaning or its, 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 its references. Like, when did that happen? I'm not sure when that happened. And, and, and that's, this, that's kind of the sense of where we have been. Where are we? Where are we now? And uh, and how that's captured on the cross with uh, today you will be, but yet the, the times are in the hands of God and that part of God's, part of what we trust that the Lord is God is that the times that God is the Lord or you are my God is that, that our times overlapping future, past and present, uh, integrated, coexisting are are guided and uh, and held by God. 
So if I turn that all the way back to the Luke 22 text, uh, because I love to weave them all together, it begins that uh, Jesus is saying he eagerly awaited this moment. And we know that this moment, I think Matt noted, is actually going to lead into um, um, the arrest, the crucifixion, uh, the death of Jesus. And yet the eager awaiting is that that very moment is the moment of God's salvation. We should say something probably briefly about Philippians 2, even though- Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great ending. We could have just let it end right there. Right? Yeah, but no, no. Can I, can I, I forgot that the Philippians ones was on this week. Can you? Yes, yeah. I think you can. This is, again, oh. this is one of the benefits of, of Rolf taking some time off is we, the three of us can just keep talking. <laughs> we can just keep talking. <laughs> this is dangerous, so dangerous. Yeah. But um, this, this text, this is one of my favorite texts out of Philippians. Um, um, and again, it goes back to uh, uh, that, that, thread of who is the greatest, uh, because this is the very text where it says to have the mind in, uh, for us to have the mind that was the mind in Christ. And that is the mind of humbleness, uh, humility, uh, a mind of emptying oneself. It's the very opposite of this mind of trying to say, how great am I? It, it, it is saying, you know, created in the image of God, it, what it means for us to be human. And we don't walk around flaunting that because what we want is for God to be glorified in our life, for God to be the one who is exalted. So no matter how God exalts us, if we have the mind that was in Christ Jesus, God will be glorified in our lives, through our lives and by our lives.